Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I am Pastor Ron Woolsey from Marshall and, well, I, up until recently, I was part, pastoring Marshall and Clinton churches um, north of here, about two and a half, three hours. Now, I've been here several times in the past, and I know that, that those of you who are faculty and staff have probably heard my story. So, but those of you who are students, I, I know you have a turnover. I'm wondering how many of you students have heard my story? A few, how many have not? Okay, all right. I'm one of the co-founders of a ministry called Coming Out Ministries. That should give you some idea of what it's about. We have taken the term, you know, the, the LGBT community is very proud of coming out of the closet to openly proclaim their homosexuality or whatever. They're very proud about that. Uh, you know, the Bible has a lot to say about pride and the LGBT issue. But we, uh, uh, we founded this branch of ministry about 10 years ago. Yeah, we're going into our 10th year right now. And uh, there were a number of us that were working individually around the country telling our stories. We got together at a camp meeting in uh, a SoCal camp meeting in California. And uh, we explored the possibility of working together because uh, we, we believed that a united ministry in this area would be much more effective than all of us working individually, and that has proven to be the case. So 10 years ago, we formed Coming Out Ministries. We're taking the term coming out, and we have redeemed it, and we are sanctifying it, and we're reusing it to the glory of God. Because uh, 1 Peter 2.9 talks about how we are to come out of darkness into his marvelous light, right? So coming out is a good term. We're also told to come out from among them and be ye separate. Also in Revelation 18, we're told, come out of her, my people. So we have every right to use that expression. And um, we are traveling the world with this ministry. Now, I have now been in about 50, 51 countries. Um, and... You know, Luke 17 tells us that as it was in the days of Noah and as it was in the days of Lot. Do you know what it was like in those days? I mean, we've all read about Noah, in the days of Noah, where um, every thought, every imagination of the heart was, um, was evil, wicked, continuously. And in the days of Lot, we know what that's all about, Sodom and Gomorrah. But Luke 17, Jesus said, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man shall be revealed. What we see around the world today, a global Sodom and Gomorrah, um, when our Supreme Court normalized gay marriage several years ago, then that has swept around the world. As goes America, so goes the world. You know, as the Sunday law becomes a national Sunday law in America, then it will eventually and very quickly become a universal Sunday law. So, you know, Revelation 12, 11 tells us that we overcome the accuser of the brethren by two things. You know what they are? Number one, the blood of the Lamb. So it's the story of Jesus Christ as we accept Jesus and we, um, we live um, to tell that story. Uh, we, it's a powerful story. There's much power in the word and power in the name of Jesus. But the text doesn't say just by the blood of the Lamb, but also by the word of our testimony. And I had wondered about that for a while, and then it dawned on me that Satan has been around for a long time. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen that Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Light represents truth, doesn't it? Satan transforms himself into an angel of light for the purpose of deception, which means to me that Satan probably can tell the story of Jesus as well as, or if not, or even better than we can. Right? He's been around a long time. In fact, he's been in heaven. He has seen Jesus personally. He knows so much more than we know. And the, the text goes on to say, therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Now, we've all seen 
these ministers that fill these huge stadiums with thousands upon thousands of people and they are so charismatic with their presentations telling the story of Jesus and and hundreds of people come flocking to the altar to give their hearts to Jesus uh, with the appeal and very emotional and so forth what is the word of their testimony that's what we need to consider does Satan demonstrate the love and power of Jesus now he can talk about it but he doesn't demonstrate it and these ministers of righteousness they can tell the story but quite often they'll be confronted with the question what about the law of God I've had this happen in in our churches where we've had evangelistic series um, a number of times people come to our meetings and they're under great conviction and they go to their Sunday church and they say pastor and I remember this one person telling me they stood up in their church on Sunday and said pastor why are we here today instead of yesterday isn't the seventh day the Sabbath and what was the word of his testimony nine out of ten is good enough really right from the pulpit I think God is okay with nine commandments out of ten another pastor confronted the same way said you know uh, yes the seventh day is the Sabbath but if I were to preach it I would lose my job that type so you know um, the the pastors in our area they understand we've been around there for 20 28 years now and we've been on the radio and all kinds of things they know and they've been confronted by their own parishioners the word of their testimony it is so important Lord uh, uh, young people and all of you if you are here in this school you have a testimony am I right I, I'm sure you all have a testimony by the way I need to know how much time I have because I need to know how to pace myself uh, 30 more minutes oh my okay here we go so I'm going to share my testimony this morning we all have a testimony uh, I believe that it is our most powerful presentation I do that as a foundation so you know where I come from in coming out ministries we like to inspire the body of Christ by the word of our testimony uh, and then we go beyond that in our uh, uh, subsequent presentations to enlighten the body of Christ with material you may not be familiar with from uh, from science and research and and all of that and the Word of God of course and then we go to the third step of equipping the Lord is using us to actually create the very resources that we needed when we were your age and in school where there were no resources in our denomination no discussion no one to talk to we floundered overwhelmed by the nature of our tendencies and temptations struggling all alone and uh, against the supernatural forces of evil and gave up and went into the world so we're very privileged that the Lord is blessing us with the very resources uh, to create the very resources that we so desperately needed I've just completed uh, my third book um, and we're going to talk some more about that this evening the subject of that third book um, but it's meeting an issue that is really spreading throughout our denomination uh, you know we have the wheat and the tares the wheat and the chaff the sheep and the goats we have truth and error and all of those things in our own midst and why wouldn't we be why wouldn't the Church of God be the the, the bullseye target of the enemy because we're the ones in the remnant church that has the message the last day message for the world and we are the ones that can expose the man of sin and in all of these things um, okay I uh, was the son of a dairy farmer my my father um, uh, started out in those early days as a dairy farmer um, he was a child raising children he was married when he was 17 he was anyone here 17 uh -huh. you're not married are you oh, okay my dad was 17 when he was married anyone here 18 he was a father when he was 18 and he very quickly fathered six of us <laughs> so in those early days it was all he could do to just keep milk on the table no uh, food on the table and provide for the family uh, we lived on a beautiful farm in northern Mississippi the patent farm it was a dairy farm and it was a beautiful place and my parents wanted to raise their children in the country they were Seventh-day Adventist Christians 
and they wanted to raise their children in the country. You know the devil knows where you are even if you're in the country. Some of you may have discovered the devil knows where you are here. The devil is here. Uh, hopefully he's not in this audience this morning because we pray that the Lord will hold back all the forces of evil. But you know, um, Satan loves to target those who are dedicated to the Lord. I mean, he works tirelessly. You know, it's not fair. He never sleeps 24-7. But God never sleeps either. Amen. And he's more powerful, isn't he? At the age of four, I was sexually molested by a farmhand working for my father. That derailed me from the age of four. No four-year-old child is equipped to deal with sex. And yet you will see children that age that are sexualized. They talk it, they act it, they don't really understand. But they've been, if, if children that age are being sexual... Uh, in their conversation, in their play, and all of those things, something has happened because normally children don't think sexually. You know, normally when you're that age and you're in early grade school, the boys think the girls all have cooties, right? And the girls think the boys have cooties and it's not, you're not going to mix because that's yucky and that's yucky and what have you. But if they have been sexualized at that age, First of all, they're not equipped, they're not mature enough mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually to cope with it. They don't know how to deal with it, and I didn't either. But I knew that what had happened was wrong. But what was really bizarre was I felt guilty. And you know, young people, some of you may have been victims in your lives, and I just want to encourage you, don't let that derail you. Don't let that determine the direction you go the rest of your life. We cannot do anything about what has happened in the past, but we have, by the grace of God, we have everything we need to determine what happens today and tomorrow and in the future. But at that age, I didn't know. But I knew it was wrong. I felt guilty. Many times victims feel guilty. They feel shame. They, they feel or are made to feel responsible. Um, I, I just know I felt very bad and felt guilty. I would not tell my parents. I did not tell a living soul what happened to me until for 20 years. No one except that person had any idea what had happened to me. It altered my behavior. Um, from that day forward, my mind was out of control. I was only four years old. I had, my mind was filled with reliving the incident it was not an unpleasant experience, uh, but it was a wrong experience. I relived it. I fantasized. I had wild, uncontrollable imaginations. And so I grew up with that in my head out of control. So I developed, from the age of four, I developed the habit of letting my mind just go wherever it wanted to go. Do you see how difficult that is to overcome later when you're old enough to realize and you want to change your way of thinking? and all of that, and you have years of habitual um, yielding to anything Satan puts in your head. And that's what happened with me. Um, at the age of five, I started playing the piano, started taking piano lessons. I did well with that, and, um, and I found that this was a way to get attention, to be accepted, because after that incident when I was four, uh, and it altered my behavior. I actually became a bedwetter after being two years potty trained. <laughs> All of us had been trained by the time we were two. But I was regressing and my parents thought I was being lazy, especially my father. And he began to punish me. And the more he punished me, what do you think? The, the worse it got. Because now it was in my mind all the time. Oh, if I do it again tonight, I'll be punished tomorrow. And you know... And so that didn't help, and so my dad turned on me and became very abusive emotionally and physically, um, even publicly shaming me. Years later, and my father uh, was a very loving, caring father, I discovered later. <laughs> but remember, he was a child raising children. He was not equipped. He didn't know what he was doing. He thought I was being lazy. They even took me to a doctor. When I was nine years old, that's five years later, and I still had the problem, the doctor said there's nothing wrong with his kidneys or his bladder. The kid's just lazy. 
That's what my dad thought anyway. So my dad doubled down on me. So I grew up feeling um, rejected by my father, unloved by my father, unaccepted, and, and um, physically and emotionally abused. The piano was a, an escape for me. And I, I was withdrawing from my own gender because I, they began, my brothers and, and the boys in the community began to tease me and mock me and, and so forth. And in Mississippi in those days, if I was playing the piano, that's something girls did, not boys. They were outside making noise. I was inside making music. That alienated me. I, I enjoyed music more than noise. But anyway, so I grew up being called all the names and, and teased and mocked. In other words, bullied. Now, when a child is bullied in this way, I want to tell you it's a form of brainwashing. If you are called sissy every day of your life, pretty soon you begin to wonder about who you are. If you are called gay and faggot and queer, you begin to wonder. It pushes you away from the, the peer group that, should be, um, uh, that you should be uh, bonding with and emulating. And so I grew up feeling alienated, troubled, timid, confused. But I was a spiritual young person. And when I started school, I determined to excel. My brother was one who could make straight A's and never crack a book. He was one year older, one year bigger, one year stronger, one year smarter, one year better looking, all of that. <laughs> He's still one year older. That's it. Okay. <laughs> But we were in the same classroom every other year, you know, two, two grades in the same class. And he could make straight A's without cracking a book, and he was popular and all of that. And I competed with that. We were so close in age, a year apart. Uh, but I had to crack the books, and I really studied hard to make the grades. So I was also at the top of the class. That brought me accolades. The music brought me accolades. And it helped fill that void in my life. Does any of this make sense to you young people? I was desperate for acceptance and, and, and all of that. Um, at the age of 12, I, was, uh, I had become basically our church pianist there in northern Mississippi. But I, being a spiritual child, I masked all of the confusion in my head. Uh, as I grew up and went into high school and then and later on into college and I was dating, you know, all the guys dated girls, right? I did the same thing. As a Christian, no girl expected me to cross a line. So it was easy for me as a Christian to date girls because I wasn't having to prove myself anyway. Do you follow my drift there? But in my mind, I was terribly confused. I was dating girls. I liked them. Uh, I even fell in love and all of that. But I was more drawn to the same gender. And that my confusion just grew with every year. Being a spiritual person, I never acted on those attractions because I wanted to be right with the Lord. Uh, I had to drop out of college my sophomore year. I was uh, working my way through making those little Debbie Nutty bars. I don't know whether you've ever heard of that. But um, I couldn't evidently keep up and make enough to pay my bill. My parents could not afford the tuition. They provided room and board. Uh, but I had to come up with the tuition. I had to drop out of college because I couldn't keep up that sophomore year, and I was um, almost immediately drafted into the military. Um, before I was drafted, I found a job in a local hospital where I was trained to be a surgical assistant. When I was in the military, I went through all of the training to be a surgical technician. It was in the days of the Vietnam era, the conflict, some people called the war. I thought for sure I would end up in Vietnam with that kind of training, being a surgical technician. But instead, they sent me to Korea, South Korea. I didn't even know we were still in South Korea. I, and I, I wondered, why am I going to South Korea? Everyone's going to Vietnam. And I didn't want to go to Vietnam, but I, that's just where I thought I would go. While I was there in South Korea, I met a group of Southern California students from La Sierra College that were in the first language school in Southern California teaching English and Bible as a mission project, uh, you know, student missionary program, and I was fascinated with what they were doing, and on the weekends I got involved with their programs, um, doing the music for their Sabbath school and church. Uh, the Adventist GIs would come to the same mission compound every Sabbath to spend the Sabbath away from our base camps, and the student missionaries were in the same location. 
I, that's where I was introduced to the student missionary program and I really I was fascinated with it. So I arranged when I finished my tour of duty in South Korea to stay there and join the student missionary program. Now some of you are going on a student missionary trip. I'll tell you, that, that can just alter your life. I mean, that can, you know, they say that, that uh, a year overseas is, I mean, well, not a year, but a mission trip overseas is kind of like a year of education. I mean, it just really broadens your perspective on life and mission and education in so many ways. And I, I really applaud you for this and the school for providing for you to go to India. I have been there. I don't want to go back. Uh, <laughs> um, if any of you ever heard of Robert Pearson, the former General Conference president, when he went through college and trained in theology, he said, Lord, I'm so excited to work for you. I'll go anywhere you want me to go, but just please don't send me to India. He did not want to go to India. He spent 25 years as a missionary in India. So you don't tell the Lord where you don't want to go, and I've never told him I don't want to go to India. So I think you may know anyway, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, there are just some places that, that are very difficult. But I had a wonderful experience there. Um, but now it's your turn. Okay. <laughs> I've been in many other places that were a lot more suitable for me and my... We all have our niche, all right? South Korea was a niche for me. And um, after being there for a year, actually, I got a little bit bored with uh, teaching for a while. You know, even though you love it, it gets a little tedious after a while. And... I was the only student missionary that could speak proper Southern English, so I decided to teach my students. How many of you are from South Korea? I know there are some of you that are Korean. Hanguk Sanamnimika? Yeah? Hmm? Ne? You're not raising your hands. I know there are several of you. How many of you are from South Korea? You can raise your hand. I know you are. There you go. Okay. <laughs> I started teaching my students to speak Southern English. I thought those California teachers spoke funny anyway. But it was really amusing one day when I heard my students going down the hall saying, Hi, y'all. Y'all come back now, you hear? I mean, to hear someone like you talk like that, I mean, it was really funny. Well... They knew where I was from, and shortly after that, this school sent me to South, they sent me South, to South Thailand. Someone's here from Thailand, anyway. But they actually sent me there to run a new school in South Thailand uh, for the next 14 months. And I just really, really enjoyed mission work. And when I finished there, I realized that uh, I, I, I thought I knew what the Lord wanted me to do with my life and that was to be a medical missionary. So I went back to Southern Missionary College. I enrolled in college to, in theology and pre-med. In my head, though I, you see I, have, I was leading a spiritual life, but in my head the confusion only grew with time to where I thought, you know, if I am going to be a medical missionary, I have got to get over this. I have, you know, I love the Lord, I love the church, I love being a Christian, and I want to be a missionary. I've got to get this stuff resolved in my head. So I came up with a brilliant idea. If I were to just get married, it would take care of everything. All right, how many of you are married? Does marriage take care of everything? <laughs> how many of you are not married? Did you see the reaction of those who are? <laughs> Marriage is not the solution for any problem. Marriage can be the beginning of problems if you're not married for the right reasons, to the right person, with the blessing of God, and with the right chemistry. I did not have the right chemistry. I married one of those funny-talking Southern California student missionaries, and I tried to make a Southern belle out of her. It didn't work. <laughs> I knew immediately after we were married, that I had made a terrible mistake and I was going to be a big disappointment to my wife. But I chose to have a Christian wife. I chose to have a Christian education. I chose to make Christian babies, and we made two of those. I chose a degree in theology. I was making good choices, but it did not take care of what was going on in my head. It only compounded the confusion 
because I thought marriage would take care of it. It didn't. That only made matters worse. But I continued striving to be a good Christian. Uh, when it was time, please don't laugh at my senior picture. My son just hee-haws when he sees this. But I mean, that's the way we were in those days. But as a senior, I was um, invited to pastor a church, Madison Campus Church. Sam, you know that church pretty well. Weren't you as, uh, a pastor there for a while? Oh, Boulevard Church. Okay, but you know Madison Campus Church. I was invited to join the pastoral staff there. That was a big church, still is. And I panicked because I'm a small town preacher, small town Christian. And I panicked and I turned down the call to ministry. But the mistake that I made was I didn't pray about it. I was so focused on pre-med and going to medical school. I had one more class in physics and then I was going to be off to medical school. And uh, I turned down the call. I didn't pray about it, which was a big mistake because I'm not a doctor today. I'm a pastor. So maybe that was God's plan A. Now it's his plan Z. I don't think I have another option. <laughs> no, this is it. Um, but uh, when I turned down that call and went on into physics uh, to finish my physics and then uh, to finish up pre-med, um, I lost my way after graduation. I had stopped studying for myself. I had started for quite some time. I was rationalizing you know, I had to make straight A's to make medical school, right? So I rationalized, we have prayer before every class, we study Bible all day long, that will suffice. What I didn't realize was I was studying to answer the test, the questions for the professors. But I wasn't studying for myself. And though I passed, and I graduated at the top of the class with an A average, I didn't have my own answers. I had answered the professor's questions. I had a lot of Bible knowledge that I did not have my own understanding and my own relationship with the Lord. It had slipped by the wayside to where when I graduated, I was no longer in those classes. Um, I slipped, I fell, I had what I call the fall from grace, and I fell headlong into the gay life. I was so tired of the struggle. I had prayed for years that God would take the gay away. He did not take the gay away. It was his fault, not mine. I was finally just going to accept who I was. It was not a choice. But that, that's problematic, isn't it? Because when you accept, don't you choose to accept? But I said, it's not a choice. It's just who I am. I'm accepting who I am. Well, I was choosing to accept. I chose to no longer struggle and to no longer fight the issue. Of course, my wife was devastated. I was very honest with her. I told her what happened, um, and we were, uh, she wanted me to go through counseling with her. Uh, she was a Christian. She loved me, she loved the Lord, she was forgiving. She said, Ron, we can make this work. We, let's get help. I don't want our marriage to end. So we went through some counseling. The counseling did me no good. The counseling that hurt me the most was when I found out that the pastors and counselors were advising her, Mrs. Woolsey, you need to just divorce this man and get on with your life. That kind can never change. Now, when I heard that, I felt that way. Once I fell over that cliff, I didn't know how I could ever be changed. But to hear pastors say it just sealed my doom. I was so disappointed and angry and bitter that if God could not change me, then he was impotent rather than omnipotent, right? If God can change me, but he doesn't choose to, then he's not a God of love. If God can change me when Jesus comes, why can't he change me now? And if he can change me, but he doesn't, then whose fault is it that I'm gay? His. You see how the devil works on the mind? We start blaming God and God cannot help us when we're blaming him. Blaming is justifying self. And we cannot be justified by him when we're justifying ourselves. Does that make sense? My father was so devastated. He had a massive heart attack shortly after I came out as a gay person. He was so proud of me graduating with a degree in theology, something he always hoped for for himself, but he couldn't. He was too busy providing for the family. Um, he had a massive heart attack, almost died. 
the doctors gave him five years to live if he had surgery. And he said, what if I don't have the surgery? They said, well, Mr. Woolsey, you probably won't live more than five years if you don't have the surgery. So what's the difference, right? Five is five. <laughs> well, he did what you would have done, I think. He checked out. He said, I could die on the operating room table. I'm going to take my chances. He didn't just take his chances. He and my mother decided to go to Uchi Pines and get involved in the Seventh-day Adventist health message to see if God could give him more than five years. I went into the world bitter and angry against God, uh, moved to Southern Florida, and then moved to Southern California, where I lived out my gay life for many years. Um, the little boy in the red shirt is my son um, at his, uh, in the eighth grade at that time, there in Southern California. But I went into the world bitter, angry against God, labeled as unchangeable, and choosing, and then becoming unreachable. Do you know anyone like that? How many of you know a gay person? So it's okay that we talk about this, right? We're talking about sexual purity this week. Listen, maybe none of you are dealing with that issue, but the principles involved in this issue relate to everyone. Because young people, we're talking about the sin issue. And when people see it from my perspective, I had a young man come to me at a camp meeting. He was listening to gossip about Pastor Ron. Someone thought they were going to discredit me by telling this person about my past. They'd never talked to me, but they thought they had all the information, so they were sharing it. Gossip, malicious gossip. The gossiper was talking to the gossipy. You know what I mean? All right. The gossiper was malicious. The gossipy was innocent. The gossipy was not listening to what Ron had done. What the gossipy was hearing was what God had done. The gossiper was not talking about God, but the gossipy was hearing about God. And the gossipy came to me. And I had no idea this had happened. And he said, man, Pastor Ron, if God can save you, he can save anybody. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean by that? He's, and then he told me what he'd heard, and I said, oh, well, that, yeah, well, some of that's true, a lot of that's true, maybe most of it's true. And it's not all true, but a lot of it's true. But what is true is that God can save anybody. And so when I tell my story, and I'm obviously not going to get through it this morning, but when I tell my story, then people from all types of issues come to me later and say, you know, you were talking to me. Because you're basically talking about overcoming sin. I said, exactly. An extreme conversion, which is what people refer to me. And mine is a, a, an extreme conversion. An extreme conversion simply reveals an extreme God, doesn't it? Extreme love, extreme mercy, extreme patience, and extreme power. Well, so... I hope that you will apply the principles. Uh, I may have to finish them this evening. But uh, the, the principles that applied to my life because I, I went into the world bitter, angry, resentful against God, labeled as unchangeable and becoming unreachable. But back home, I had a praying family. My parents loved me unconditionally. My family did. None of them made me feel unaccepted, uh, and they prayed without ceasing. My parents could never afford to travel much from Mississippi. Somehow they found a way to get to Southern California almost every year to spend time with their prodigal son, me, in my home, with me, with my friends. They loved me. They loved my friends. They did not condone our behavior, but they never made us feel condemned. That's important. When Jesus said, neither do I condemn you to marry, that's, that is um, amazing love, isn't it, and compassion. But then he said, now go and sin no more. No compromise on the word of God. Now the gay community today loves that first part of the sentence. You know, um, neither do I condemn thee. They love that. But when it comes to go and sin no more, they say, well, you can't say that. Only Jesus can say that. That's hate speech. 
Well, there's not a period after neither do I condemn thee. I think it's a semicolon. <laughs> of course, the punctuation is not inspired, but you get the point. <laughs> the sentence is, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. You can't separate the two. But the gay community likes to separate. One part is love, the other part is hate. Um, but my parents, they were that way. They loved me unconditionally and they prayed for me without ceasing and then they became forgetful. What do I mean by that? Every time they left my home, they left something behind. Under my pillow, in my bed, somewhere around the house. They knew that I was unreachable. They couldn't talk to me. I wouldn't go anywhere, listen to anything, read anything, watch anything, or talk to anybody that had anything to do with religion. I was unreachable. So they thought, well, we'll just forget things. And so <laughs> one thing they left behind was a big, beautiful King James study Bible, Ellen G. White comment, commentary study Bible. It was beautiful. I didn't throw it away. I just stuck it in the bookcase. I wasn't interested in reading it. On another trip, they had left behind a nine-volume set. <laughs> I mean, how do you forget a nine-volume set? On another occasion, they left behind a five-volume set. My, my bookcase was getting full. Then there was this book, The Story of Redemption. I found later a beautiful book, The Story of Redemption. It is just an amazingly beautiful book. And then there's this little book called Steps to Christ. Uh, I wasn't interested in reading any of them. I just put them away and let them collect dust. But I, they were tokens of love, and I didn't have the heart to, to let them go, to throw them away. So, it's 8.30. Um, I, I'm trying to figure out where's a good place to cut. But those... those <laughs> I call this my, my Left Behind series. Have you ever heard about the Left Behind series? Well, this is the real Left Behind series. This is the Word of God, Left Behind for a purpose. And can you see what the Lord was doing through my parents? He was setting me up. Because he knew I wouldn't go anywhere, read anything, watch anything, listen to anything, talk to anybody about religion. So he just put it all in my house. And there it sat until the Lord decided now is the time to hook him and reel him in. And that's when I started having this dream. I'm going to have to save that. To let <laughs> five minutes? Oh my. <laughs> One night I had this horrible dream in which I was, uh, it was very realistic. Uh, just as real as being here. It was a little kind of dark and gloomy, but, you know, that can be realistic. But in that dream, my life was passing before me, and it wasn't from beginning to the present. It was my present life. And I'm just going to throw some pictures up here, and please don't laugh any more than you absolutely have to. But um, I was a dancer, and so I was in the country western <laughs> dancing. I said, don't laugh. Okay, I was a country western dancing, I was a ballroom dancer and, a, and dance instructor, and these things were in my dream. Uh, I was into inline skating, I was a party animal. I was a hang glider pilot, I loved flying in the mountains. Um, I did a lot of bicycling, and then I would squeeze in work once in a while. <laughs> no, I had to work every day too. But the thing is, my life, can you see, my life was so packed with activity, what do you think I was doing? I was trying to crowd out any influence for the Holy Spirit. There was never a dull moment. When I would go to bed at night, I would turn on the TV at the foot of the bed, I'd leave it on all night. Why? So I wouldn't have to get up and turn it on if I woke up. So it played all night long. My, I was jamming the signal. You see, I was jamming God's signal all day long and all night long, every day of my life. Suddenly in that dream, the scene lit up. And I looked up, and this is what I saw. The coming of Jesus. And I was lost. I'll tell you, young people, it was the most horrific nightmare and dream I had ever had. When the Bible talks about how the wicked call for the rocks and mountains to fall on them and hide them from the face of the Lord, that was me. I was 
terrified. I was not rejoicing at the coming of Jesus. I was terrified. And I woke up um, in terror that night. And then I remember for the first time thanking God for something. What do you think I thanked him for? Thank God it was just a dream, I said. <laughs> it's not for real. And I dismissed it. I went back to sleep and got up the next morning and went about life and decided, um, you know, it was just a dream. Time is not over for me. There's still time. Well, what do you think the Lord did? And I know this was from the Lord because he brought it again. Not the next night, the next week, or even the next month. It gave me a bit of time to think about it or to dismiss it. Then I had the same dream again. And I had the same reaction again. And that became a recurring nightmare for three years. About three years. You know, it took Jonah three days, right? Three days. <laughs> I was a hard nut to crack. It was about three years. But you know, isn't that a little prophetic? A day for a year? Don't read about it. A day for a year? A day, three days for Jonah, three years for me. You know, we're in real time now. And then I finally woke up in my mind one day and I said, you know, I can keep on blaming God for everything wrong in my life until Jesus does come in those clouds of glory. I'm still lost. And that's where things begin to turn. And maybe that's a good cliffhanger right there to leave it right there for now. I had hoped to get through the whole story because it's kind of hard to, to, to pick up. But I can pick up. Can I pick up from there this evening? We'll, we'll go a little farther. But that's where the Lord got my attention. It took him three years to do it, but he got my attention to where I started. I stopped blaming. And when you stop blaming, then God can step in. Then my conscience kicked in. Then, you know, Jeremiah 3 says, only acknowledge thine iniquity and I will heal your backsliding. I started acknowledging this is a sin issue on my part. When I stopped blaming God and started owning up to my own participation in this life of sin, that's when things really started kicking in and the Lord started working. And this is only half of the story, so I'll finish it this evening. But um, I hope that you can draw from this. First of all, God loves you more than you can ever imagine. If you have people praying for you, he's going to do whatever it takes to get your attention. He cannot choose for you. But he can certainly wake you up in the middle of the night and make you face eternal realities. To help you realize the seriousness of your situation and the seriousness of your need of a Savior. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your amazing love and compassion and patience that you are not willing that any should perish, even those people in the world that seem to be unreachable and unchangeable. Jesus died for them too. He loves them too. And... He just wants all of us to accept him, to be with him, to be with you for all eternity. Lord, I praise you for your untiring work that you never sleep, that you are so much greater than the devil. You are a God of love. Nothing is impossible with you. You are mighty to save the whosoevers from whatsoever, even to the uttermost. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thanks for joining us here at Washington Hills College and Academy for our weekend program. We sincerely hope you've been blessed. Also, to keep sharing the good news, be sure to hit that subscribe button and tap the notification bell before you go so you'll know when we upload the next video. Be sure to check us out on Facebook and Instagram. Links are in the description below. Have a blessed Sabbath.